I've made so many mistakes traveling all across Southeast Asia and since I definitely don't want you to do the same, here are my top 27 travel tips on planning your trip over to Southeast Asia. Hi, I'm Grace and for seven months I've solo traveled all across Southeast Asia, getting lost and taking photos across Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Malaysia has been a dream ever since I got into travel photography. Even with a global shutdown, somehow in some way made it work and through all of the challenges yet some of the most memorable moments of my life i'm here to share with you everything you need to know before your visit right before i went i had absolutely no idea what i was going to plan and when i decided to go it was right around the end of covid so a lot of countries were still closed off entry rules were changing by the day and i was really nervous i wasn't even sure if i was going to make it over to my first country which is thailand but somehow in some way I've been able to navigate my entire journey by myself and obviously with the help of a lot of few friends and amazing locals I've met along the way. And if this is your first time traveling in Southeast Asia, you're probably wondering when the best time is to go. So from my experience, I landed in Thailand in January and that was the most perfect time to go to Thailand. There are some times of the year where it gets really, really rainy, but I totally recommend that if you're planning on going to either Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, or Cambodia, that the best time to go is in between October to March. During my trip there, I actually went back to Thailand in May and it just rained so much. And it's not just regular rain, it's like really hard, humid rain. Girls, if you guys plan on getting your hair done or anything, it's literally not worth it. And in terms of Indonesia and Malaysia, the best time to go is between May and September. I went to both Malaysia and Indonesia during July and it was the most perfect time to go. But if you guys do plan on heading over to some of the countries during the rainy season, I just highly recommend you bringing an umbrella or a rain jacket with you at all times. But it's not like it rains all day. It usually rains either really early or in the afternoon for one or two hours and that's it. But the rain is usually really unpredictable so you just never know. Since all the countries are relatively close together, you're probably wondering where do you start? I would probably recommend starting off in Thailand and this is actually where a lot of people start off at. Most people actually start off in Bangkok which is Thailand's biggest city. There are a lot of flight routes that land in Thailand. And when you're there, you're going to be meeting so many other travelers and digital nomads and also a lot of locals who's been traveling Southeast Asia and been living there for years. So they obviously have the best advice to give you. For me, I flew from New York all the way to Seoul, Korea. And then from Seoul, Korea, I transferred over to Bangkok, Thailand. During COVID, there weren't a lot of flight options. However, this was the best route for me. And obviously also depending on how long you're planning on staying in each country for, flights in between cities are relatively cheap. There were times I've spent $30 from one city to the other and then really last minute flights I've spent 140 US dollars but that is still relatively cheap compared to maybe if you're flying in the US where a last minute ticket might cost you seven to eight hundred dollars and obviously because I was trying to visit as many countries as I could I just stayed for as long as my visa allowed me to so in Thailand I actually did renew my visa I stayed there for about two months Cambodia after for a month Vietnam for about a month Philippines for a month and then Malaysia for about two weeks and Indonesia for about another two which leads me over to my next point visa situations so this is one of the most common questions I get but before entering any country you just want to make sure that you have all the needed documents prior to your arrival. I always check the .gov websites and you want to make sure you're clear of entry at least within a week before you get there. There are some countries where you can get a visa upon arrival. For example, in Indonesia, I paid about 30 US dollars to get a visa upon arrival. It was super easy. In Cambodia, you can get a visa upon arrival for about $40. However, if you do plan on getting your Cambodia visa, beforehand, it's maybe 10 or $15 cheaper. When I was entering into Thailand, I had to go through the Thai pass because this was still under COVID and it was really strict trying to get into Asia in general, but just make sure you have your approval at least a week before. The country that took the longest time to actually get approved was actually Vietnam. That took me about four or five days to actually get approved. I heard if you are in Vietnam, maybe even a day after your visa expires, you can get in a lot of trouble. So you just wanna make sure that you're following the rules at all times. I know I should not have favorites, but so far out of all the countries I've been to in Southeast Asia, I think Vietnam has been my favorite. <laughs> it's a little sad that I'm leaving tomorrow. 
but I'm gonna make the most of it and then reapply for my visa before I go home back to the States, whenever that is. I don't wanna go. I don't wanna go back. Obviously, when you're packing, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I need to bring this, I need to bring that. Honestly, guys, I highly, highly recommend that you underpack. It's better to underpack because when you're there, you're gonna wanna shop. There are so many markets all around every country. There are walking streets, food markets. I literally brought one pair of sneakers and one pair of sandals and those are the only two shoes that I wore within seven months. My sneakers, they're still in good shape right now. <laughs> I did bring hiking shoes just in case, but I just only wore them one time when I was trekking in Sapa. And okay, I will say that was worth the bring, but you don't necessarily need to bring any type of hiking shoes. I also recycled the same three or four tank tops. I bought shorts in Thailand and I wore them literally every single day. So I really put good decent to them. In terms of medicine, you do want to bring the right type of medicine that works for you. So when I got to Thailand, I actually got code for the very first time in my life and I was put under a 10 day quarantine. This was my first time in a new country. I was all by myself and I had some medication and I'm really thankful that I did bring them and I've used every single one of them at least once during my trip. So once I got out of quarantine, I explored Bangkok, Thailand for the very first time. I'm finally all packed and ready to leave this place. I can't believe I've been here for 10 days. Honestly, kind of feels like three. And I'm finally gonna be exploring Bangkok. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm in Asia. What? <laughs> it hasn't hit me yet. So you're probably wondering, was it safe? Traveling all across Southeast Asia was extremely, extremely safe. I never felt scared or worried for my safety. And actually I learned this because I did post a YouTube video thinking that I came across a man with a gun at an airport in Vietnam, but locals were commenting on my videos and they were actually saying that it's actually illegal to own a gun in Vietnam and you could potentially go to jail. In terms of solo traveling friendliness, it is very, very solo travel friendly there, but obviously wherever you are in the world, you wanna take precaution of yourself and your safety. It's also really easy to make friends. There are people who are in the same mindset as you. Till this day, I still keep in contact with people that I've met while solo traveling in Southeast Asia and I miss them so much. If you are interested in taking your very first solo trip, I've actually created a guide on how to prepare you for your first solo trip. So if you're interested in that, I will leave that link in the description below. Along with being very solo travel friendly, obviously Southeast Asia is known for a budget and backpackers. Personally, I haven't backpacked Southeast Asia, but I chose not to. And the reason why is because I already have one big camera bag that I have to carry around. So if I added that into a bigger backpack, I would have had no space for anything else. So for me, I brought in a fanny pack, a big backpack. Okay, backpack, let's go. <sighs> uh, I have this love-hate relationship with this backpack. Actually, it's not that heavy today. I'm only carrying one tripod and not two. And then a big luggage. And I think when I first got to Southeast Asia, it weighed about like 45 pounds. But by the time I left, <laughs> It was like 60 pounds or so. I personally never had any struggle trying to get anywhere because my luggage was in the way of things. I've actually had people who were willing to help me carry my luggage if I was trying to get to a hotel, but I always warn them, you don't have to because it's really heavy, but they were very gracious <laughs> to do that for me. But the one thing that you do have to consider if you're planning on checking in your luggage is that you have to get to the airport a little bit earlier because you do have to stand in line and you have to wait to check in your bag. And although I had to pay a little bit more to check in my luggage, it wasn't really expensive. In Vietnam, I think I paid no more than 13 US dollars to check in my luggage flying anywhere. Leaving Cambodia was the most expensive. When I left Cambodia, it cost me $60 to check in my luggage. Every single flight under Philippines Airlines cost me $50 flat and sometimes my checked in luggage actually cost more than the actual plane ticket. But. I had no choice. This was my home and I was willing to pay for it no matter where I went. The next thing that you do want to prepare and be note of is where to get a SIM card and should you get a SIM card. So obviously depending on your length of stay and your phone carrier, 
maybe you want to opt in for your phone carrier's international phone plan but for me because it was more long term and i had no idea how long i was going to stay in southeast asia for i got a physical sim card in every single country and no i did not buy a sim card at the airport and i easily could have but obviously everyone knows that it's more expensive to get a sim card at the airport but then how did i get around if i didn't have a sim card from the airport to my hotel so in all the airports there is really good working wi-fi and if you guys don't know already the main taxi driving app in southeast asia is grab grab is like the uber of southeast asia before you get to southeast asia you want to download the grab app you could request cars motorbikes tuk tuks you could even request food on this app and so before i got to any hotel i made sure i connected my phone over to the wi-fi and then i would call the grab car to pick me up and because my grab app was linked to my credit card but just automatically charged my card every time I went from the airport to my first hotel. So the first thing I do every time I get into a country is get to my hotel, connect to the Wi-Fi, drop off my stuff, go to a convenience store, get water and a SIM card. The other reason why I decided to get a SIM card is because you do get a local phone number. This actually really helped me a lot because there were some times where I wanted to call a tour company or if I used a different taxi or ride sharing app that I was able to call my drivers and it actually came in a lot of handy and I totally recommend that you guys get a physical or a virtual eSIM in every country that you go to. In terms of transportation, I just recommend that you take any type of public transportation that is catered to that country. Everything from trains to motorbikes, tuk-tuks, and sleeper buses. This is a total experience that you want when you're traveling in Southeast Asia. Sometimes I just really miss driving in tuk-tuks with open doors, sharing sleeper buses with random people, but that is just all part of the adventure. How was your first hour experience on this sleeper bus. Excellent, excellent. Oh, uh, yeah? There's the, the, about that much space. <laughs> Not even two bodies wide. It's no, it's two foot wide. Yeah, it's probably, yeah. <laughs> Next important tip is that no matter where you're traveling outside of your country, you want to make sure that you have an international health insurance. Just in case anything happens to you abroad, you know that you're covered. The international health insurance that I use is called Safety Wing. It's $42 a month and you're able to resume and cancel your plan at any time. It was an ease of mind and it backed me up in case anything happened to me. Obviously, we all know how annoying it is when ATMs just eat up our withdrawal fees. <laughs> Wherever you are in the world, I cannot express this enough that I highly, highly, highly recommend everyone to get the Charles Schwab debit card. Oh my gosh, I have saved hundreds of dollars. I never got charged an ATM fee or foreign transaction fee. At the end of every month, you actually get the ATM fees back into your account. It was definitely an ease of mind and it kind of just worked perfectly because I didn't have to carry huge amounts of cash at one time. Alongside with this is that if you need to call a family or a friend urgently back at home, but you don't want to spend all of your minutes, download Skype. I have been able to call US based numbers on Skype and it has really saved me hundreds of dollars. I want to say I used Skype calling at least once or twice a month but aside from this that no matter what country number that i actually got i was still able to facetime my friends i started using facebook messenger again and if you guys are watching this from the us yeah you gotta re-download facebook messenger because it's one of the most popular apps that's actually used in asia some countries not even instagram it's literally <laughs> facebook messenger but it was that and then i also was able to call some people through instagram as well so I had a couple of options. You want to also download WhatsApp and Telegram. And if you're going to China, then WeChat. And then all across Southeast Asia, there was really, really, really good and fast Wi-Fi because there's a lot of travelers that come in and out of the countries. Having good Wi-Fi is literally one of the most important things. There are a bunch of cafes, restaurants that will just allow you to use your Wi-Fi. But when I was traveling, there were actually some websites that I couldn't get access to because my IP address was not in the States. But what's also really handy is getting a VPN. I used my VPN from NordVPN and this was literally a lifesaver and I was able to access some websites while I was traveling abroad. Anywhere you
you are in Southeast Asia, you want to make sure you have extra tissues and napkins and hand sanitizer at all times. There has been countless bathrooms where there has been no toilet paper. You're kind of just using the bathroom on the ground and tissues and hand sanitizer will come in great handy. Other things that I recommend carrying around with you, sunscreen, you wanna make sure you're wearing loads and loads of sunscreen, a fanny pack. You'll notice that a lot of people wear fanny packs, but it's really, really useful. And especially when you're walking in the streets, you don't wanna get pit pocketed and you wanna make sure that your phone's tied down to you. And a microfiber towel. This one came in so much handy because again, you just never know when it was gonna rain. And sometimes you were just really, really, really sweaty. Another must bring item is a universal travel adapter. And all these items that I've mentioned, I will link them in the description below. So I hope this tip is a little bit of common sense, but when you're in any country, you want to learn the basics of the language. The first thing that I will learn in every country is how to say hello, goodbye, thank you, the bathroom, and the bill. I never had a problem or had trouble trying to get around anywhere because there were a lot of people who knew at least a little bit of English, which helped a lot. But if I was in an area or if I was trying to communicate with someone who didn't know English at all, I would use Google Translate and it was on point. If you are worried about the tap water in Asia, I don't recommend that you drink them, but that you buy the water bottles at convenience stores. The big water bottles are really cheap. They're about 50 cents. The little ones are about 25 cents. I actually did bring a water bottle with me, but surprisingly, I didn't even use it once. I thought I would use it a lot more, but the plastic water bottles at the convenience stores are just a lot more convenient. If you are grabbing street food and you're a little bit worried about the water that they use when cooking the food, don't be nervous at all. I personally have never gotten food poisoning or a bad food experience when I was there. But if this ever does happen to you, this is why having medicine is really important. Girls, it doesn't matter if you're not expecting your period to come or not, bring extra tampons with you. It was really, really difficult to try to find tampons. And if I did, they were really expensive and there weren't a lot. I thought I brought enough tampons, but it only lasted me for about three months. And it was just really, really difficult trying to find tampons. Of course, places has pads, but good quality tampons were just really, really hard to find. Where did I stay in each city? How did I know where to stay? What district? All right, in terms of trying to stay in Airbnbs, hotels, or hostels, I personally have only stayed in hotels. I have nothing against staying at hostels, but because I had so much camera gear, it was more of an ease of mind being able to have my own space at a hotel. If you are planning on traveling Southeast Asia with a friend, if you split a hotel room, it's almost the same price as a hostel, but you get more space, privacy, and it's just nice being able to get to the hotel after a really long traveling day and just have your own space and rest. However, if you are looking to meet people or make any friends, obviously the hostels are where you wanna be. To find best hotels, you can either use Agoda or Booking.com. For hostels, you can use Hostel World. Within six months of traveling all across Southeast Asia, I've actually paid zero dollars on hotels, accommodations, and flights. So. Throughout six months of traveling, I should have spent $3,700 on flights. However, I only spent $276. And what's funny was that I actually spent more money out of pocket on checked in luggage, which was $546. In terms of hotels, I, yes, I did write everything down. I'm checking my notes right now. In total, I should have spent $4,350 on hotels. However, I spent $539 instead on hotels. And so I have saved a lot of money. And how did I do this? I have prepared and I have saved a lot of credit card points before my travels. And if you guys are interested in how I did this, I actually made another credit card video. If you guys are interested in watching that, I will also leave that in the link in the description below. So what was the total spend traveling in Southeast Asia? Overall, with flight and hotels and transportation, I should have spent $9,000. However, I cut that down to zero. So over six months, I've spent about 10 to $11,000. But this also depends on the type of spender and traveler that you are. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm like the most budget traveler. However, I don't really spend a lot as a person. And because I knew that I was in Southeast Asia long-term, I actually had to control all the souvenirs that I wanted to get, which was a little bit hard. However, I did end up getting like really small things for myself. In the last country, 
year that I went to, which was actually in Korea, I just went ham and my luggage was just going overboard. When I was traveling, my main objective and my goal in each country was to take photos. So there were a lot of times where I'd rather wake up in the morning to catch a sunrise or a sunset and then maybe at the end of the day get a drink by myself, but I didn't really go too crazy. When you are in Southeast Asia, you are going to see mopeds and motorbikes everywhere. And if you have always wanted to try riding one yourself, I highly recommend that you do so. I rode a motorbike for my very first time in Thailand. And after that, I was like, I don't want to own a car in the States. I literally just want to ride a motorcycle for the rest of my life. They are really fun to ride, but they can also be dangerous to prepare you. Just make sure that you watch videos on how to ride them at the locals. And once you're there, it's really not that difficult. But the one thing that I recommend that you get is an Apple watch because the first time I ever rented the motorbike was in Chiang Mai and I was like how am I supposed to look at my phone and navigate where I'm going to and look at the maps both times and, and then I found myself stopping every like half mile to check my maps what ended up happening was I would just put my headphones in and then I would put the address on Google Maps and navigate it through my Apple watch I don't think I would have been able to navigate the country and travel without it. But if you are not riding the motorbike and you're just walking on the streets, be cautious of the motorbike drivers because there are some cities like in Ho Chi Minh City, Bangkok or Manila where people on their motorbikes will snatch your phones. It happens really often. So you just want to make sure that you have your phone in your fanny pack or in your bag at all times. This point I hope is a no-brainer but you do want to take advantage of all the street food. Try not eating the basic pad thai's and the pho because all Although they are really good and they're probably some of the best, there are so many different type of food options. Before going to Vietnam, I've never heard of Ban Cha and till this day, that is the only thing I would get at any Vietnamese restaurant. In Thailand, I have never had had Kaprao. I crave it pretty often. So when you are trying foods from different countries, to be a little bit more open-minded and just try something new. Oh, and on top of that, I feel like there are reputations that Cambodia doesn't have the best tasting food. I will say that the first week I was in Cambodia, I wasn't really the biggest fan of the food. However, when I met my friend, she actually introduced me to some of the best Cambodian foods. I don't even remember their names, but if you're there, try to find a local to take you to all the hot spots because it is so worth it and their food is so underrated. I didn't really want to eat American or Western food, but obviously there were days where I did crave pizza and I did crave brunch. I think it's okay that you do try out some of the Western food in these countries, which I will say has been some of the most delicious and the best Western food that I've had abroad. You realize that places like Thailand, a lot of people move to Thailand after they retire, some of them being chefs and they open up amazing restaurants. And once you eat the food, you're like, am I in Italy or am I in Thailand? But the best, best, best Western food has actually been in Bali. Every single non-Balinese restaurant that I went to just had banging, banging Western food and actually better than some places that I've had in the States. So good. You guys wanna say hi? So if you are planning on going from country to country, to note that some countries actually require you to have an exiting flight. Let's just say, for example, you're going to Vietnam. You have to make sure that before you enter the country, you need a flight stating that you're leaving. But once you are checking in for your flight, don't freak out because you will be able to purchase a flight at the gate. Overall, all the people within Southeast Asia, they're so incredibly nice. Like I didn't realize how nice they were. People there are so friendly. They're so welcoming with open arms and they're really happy that you're traveling in their country. So last but not least, tip number 27, don't forget to show off your confidence. Whether or not you're traveling by yourself or with a group of friends, people know and they can sense your energy. Honestly, once you allow yourself to just be in the moment and just immerse yourself into the country and the culture, you're gonna feel so free. I was so scared going to Thailand by myself because I unexpectedly had to go through a 10 day quarantine. I didn't know anyone in the country. I just kind of had to calm myself down and learn how to be present with myself. With all of this being said, these are my top 
27 travel tips on when you're planning your trip over to Southeast Asia. And from all the hundreds of mistakes that I've made, I hope that at least one of these travel tips have helped you plan your trip better. And although I am not currently traveling right now, I hope to do so in the next few weeks to months. But if you guys haven't done so already, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe onto this channel for more travel vlogs like this. And I will see you guys in the next video. Safe and happy travels, y'all.